from Isaiah 40, verse 25 to 31. And I'll just read that real quick for us. And it's, it's a lovely passage to introduce uh, Brother Dave's words this morning. So I'll hand it straight over to him. Thanks, Uncle right. Dave. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, we have got a really interesting uh, subject to look at uh, this morning. And I'm going to tell you again, I have got my slippers on. I've never been to Sunday school with my slippers on before. So this is something new. But at least I'm not eating my breakfast like Joseph is. So I'm going to put it on the full screen so I can't see him eating my breakfast. We're going to talk about God this morning. Last time I was with you all, um, a couple of years ago, we talked about the stars, if you remember. And we looked and see how we counted the stars and saw how many stars there were. And if you had stars of as sands of grain, uh, sorry, grains of sand, you'd have to have heaps and heaps of uh, uh, sand in, in container, uh, containers to go past you. And it'd take you three years to see all the stars uh, in all the sand and the containers, if you remember that image. We're going to sort of look at something different um, uh, today, but a similar sort of thing. So I'll put the full screen on. And I'm going to show you uh, this, this picture. You can see the, the picture of the, the beautiful colours there. Uh, and we're going to talk about that. But I'm going to put the full screen on and show you a picture of me. All right. Are you ready? Here we go. Wait a minute. Up here. Play that. All right. There's the beautiful colours. You can see that. No, I can't see anybody else now. So um, I'm assuming you all can see it. Here's a picture of me. All right, I try to do some pottery work. I got some clay because I thought, well, people are made of clay. Adam was made from the clay of the ground, so I got some clay, uh, and that's as good as I got. I'm not very good at pottery, obviously. But what it shows to us is that human beings are ordinary people. Uh, we're made of clay. We're pretty amazing, but we're made of clay. But God is awesome. He is extraordinary. He's better than ordinary. He is amazing and he's made all sorts of things. And we looked at, as we said last time, we looked at the stars. But there's a quote in the book of Romans, uh, which says this, in one of the versions, it says this, the basic reality of God is plain enough. Open your eyes and there it is. And we can look and see up in the sky and we see all those colours. And if we take a long and thoughtful look, if you look for a long time and you think about it, of what God has created, people have always been able to see what their eyes as such can't see. So what we're looking at is not just things, but we're looking at God's power, the mystery of his divine being, these ideas that God is just so far above us we're seeing things, but they're not, we're not seeing God. We're seeing things that God made, but we're saying things about God. And one of the things about God is this color, beauty. Now, I don't know if you know anyone called Aurora. I've got a great niece called Aurora, and she's very beautiful. And this is another Aurora. This Aurora has a different name. It's called Aurora Borealis, and it is called the Northern Lights. And what it is, is up in the north of the world, right up high, up near uh, the Arctic, sometimes you see these lights jumping across the sky in all these beautiful colours. And what it is, is these, all these fast-moving particles from the sun, um, they hit the electromagnetic um, field that protects the Earth, and they're called solar winds. And when they bump into gas atoms in our atmosphere, they call these colours. So the different colours are is that if it hits oxygen uh, atoms, then it becomes red and green and yellow. And if it hits nitrogen atoms, it becomes violet and blue. So we've got all these colours. And when the, the solar wind hits the atoms and the atoms make these colours, and you think, what's the point of it all? Why, why is there colours? Why do they do that? And there's no reason except to say how beautiful it is, how lovely it is, how amazing God is that he can do things like that for no particular reason. He makes our life colourful and he makes our life interesting to show that he is colourful 
and that he is interesting. Now, I hope you've all got some something you can um, get a prize with. It might be a, a, some Cocoa Pops or some Nutri-Grain or another spoonful of your breakfast if uh, Joseph still hasn't finished his. But here's a question, all right? See if you, you can yell out the answer. I won't be able to hear it, but you can yell it out for yourself. What is that? All right? What is that? Well, if you've yelled out, it's a leaf, you're half right. It is a leaf, but it's not just a leaf. All right, what is it? Let's take the little black line off and see. If you can see, look at that. It's actually a butterfly. It's called a leaf butterfly. And it's very clever because it looks like a leaf. So birds won't fly past and say, oh, I want to eat a leaf. They don't like leaves. They like to eat butterflies. So it gets protected. However, it is still beautiful because when it opens its wings, it's got color. So it hides how beautiful it is. It puts its wings together. So I can't tell everyone it's beautiful and it protects itself and it become, looks like a leaf, but when it wants to, it can show it's actually beautiful as well. And these are just little things that tell us about what God is like and what God can do for us. Now, here's another test for you. Here is a B, all right? We know it's a B because it says it on the screen, doesn't it? And we talk about busy as a B. Now, I want you, I'm not, I can't see what's happening, but I want you, perhaps see Seth, Seth can stand up. Can you stand up off your couch, Seth? I can't see you. And I want you to flap your arms up and down like a bee as quickly as you can. All right, so I want you to flap your arms up and down like that and see how many times, how fast can you flap your arms up and down, all right? And you think you've got to count for one second. You know how you count for one second? You say 1,000. So if you say 1,000, 2,000, that's two seconds. So you count like that and say, how many times you flap? I think 1,000. I think I clap, flapped four times in one second. Four times in one second. I don't know how well Seth went. But do you know bees? Bees flap 200 times a second. They flap their wings 200 times a second. And they keep working from sunrise to sunset and they visit between 50 and 100 flowers a day. And they have a little snack, a snap, a nap every now and then for 30 seconds. But they only live for three to six weeks. You imagine if you're flapping that much all day long and only have a 30 second nap. No wonder you only live for three to six weeks. But this is what bees are like. And bees are just amazing, like all other creation. And there's a psalm that says, the Lord which made heaven and earth, he will not slumber. He doesn't sleep. God, this is sort of a, a, an insight into what God is like. God doesn't sleep and he's, he's doing things all the time with amazing energy. And he keeps Israel. He neither slumbers nor sleeps. God is our keeper and he is busy all the time like a bee but never sleeping. Busiest bee is God and never sleeping. So he gives us these, these little uh, things to explain to us what he is like, his his divine or his godly attributes. Now, here's a question. I don't think even Joseph Richards will know the answer to this question. But on a clear night, away from the city lights, using your eyes, not using some binoculars. In fact, the other night I was lying in bed. When I lie in bed, I can actually see, I, 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 can, I can lie on my pillow and I can see out and I can see down a river. We've got a river where we live and I can look on the river and the lights on the river and I can see in the sky when I lie on my bed. It's really lovely. And the other night I saw something in the sky and I thought, what's that? And I thought it might have been uh, Venus, the, the, the planet Venus. So I went out, but I could see another light next to it. And I thought, oh, maybe it's a plane with headlights, you know, coming along. But I kept on looking and looking and the two lights were, no, it didn't move. It wasn't a plane. So I got out my binoculars and I saw there was two lights together. Later on, I found out that the planets Mars and Venus were very close together, only one degree from each other. So that's what I was seeing. So on a clear night, you can see things like that. But we can see, you and I can see, if you go out into the outback, 
all the way to the Andromeda galaxy, just with your eyes. Now, I don't know where it is, but evidently you can see the Andromeda galaxy from your eyes. Guess how far the Andromeda galaxy is from the Earth. So you've got to put a number in the, bo in the bottom of that box, which is how far from the Earth? How far do you think the Andromeda galaxy is from the Earth? Now, remember last time we spoke about the stars and huge numbers. So you've got to think big. Of course, God is big. That's the other thing about God. How is far from the Earth? million light years away? Two and a half million light years from the Earth. Very close, Joseph. It was only halfway there. You can see, your eyes can see two and a half million light years distance. Isn't that amazing? That is incredible. These are amazing facts. And let's talk about the eye. You know, five months old, when a, when a baby's forming inside its mother, the human baby connects a million nerve endings from the brain to a million nerves in the eye. They've got to connect together. Nerves do that. Nerves find each other. You know, when I used to, I was a, I was a dentist, and we used to uh, do things, and sometimes we did surgery. And if you did surgery where someone had done something and damaged a nerve and the nerve was cut, if you put, if you stitch together that part of the body and you put the nerves near each other, eventually the nerves will find each other and join together in time. Sometimes it takes about six months, but they'll find each other still, uh, even if that you cut them uh, once, you're, once you're born. But when you're being developed, the nerves find each other and the ones from the brain have to find the ones from the eye and there's a million of them and they're all going to find each other so the eye can see. But when they find each other, they've found each other, but there's still all this skin in front of them, this skin in front of the eye. And it's only until they're, you're six months old in, in the womb that some little uh, cells cut across that skin. And when they cut across the skin, they give you eyelids. And if you didn't have eyelids cutting up, it doesn't matter if you had an eye behind, you can't see through your eyelids. So these are amazing things that God has done for us. Now, wouldn't it be great to have eyes that look in all directions, 360 degrees? You know, can you imagine having eyes that you could actually see behind you and, and around you and everything? You wouldn't have to turn your head at all. You'd just stand there and your eyes would move around. That'd look, that'd be great, wouldn't it? It'd be cool. And you, but don't wish for it because if you wish for an eye like that, this is what you've got to look like, all right? That's what you look like if you've got one of those eyes. That's a chameleon. And they can see around 360 degrees. They can see all around themselves. They don't have to move and they can, their eyes can go in different directions. They can look one way and the other one can look back. They can do amazing things with their eyes. So this is God saying he can make anything. God can do anything. If you think about an idea, and we're going to look at some of these uh, this morning, God can do anything. And this is, this is the point about our awesome God. He can do anything, even things that we think are wild and amazing. He can do it. And he tells us this. Now, this chameleon is pretty good as well. He's got this amazing tongue. So not only has he got these amazing eyes, but he's got this tongue with a sticky bit at the end, and he can go along and he go chomp with his tongue, out it comes, and he gets his food. Can you imagine being at a fraternal dinner and you're walking past the smorgasbord with all the food on the table and you could just walk along and with your eyes, if you're a chameleon, you could look across here and with your tongue, choop, I'll have that sausage roll, thanks, Boom, and you get it. That'd be pretty good, wouldn't it? All right? I don't think it'd be very, I mean, it wouldn't look very nice doing it, but, you know, but if everyone was doing it, it'd be okay. Chameleons can do that. And tongues are amazing things. Now, we have got very dangerous tongues, all right? Human beings, you and I, you think that's pretty dangerous. Human beings have dangerous tongues. Let me show you a picture of our dangerous tongue. Here is our dangerous tongue. And I suppose you've all got dangerous tongues. You could show each other your tongues if you like. I can't see you, so that's fine. But there's your, why is it so dangerous? The Bible says how dangerous it is it is got poison. It can be poisonous, all right? The tongue is a restless evil, says James. This is what we're talking about, James, this weekend. Full of deadly poison. So does that mean when you touch something, it's poisonous? No. What it's telling you is things you say can hurt people. So your tongue 
can hurt people because of what it says, what it does. It can be very poisonous. You can say nasty things to people. So we've got to be careful about tongues. So we look at the animals and we say, they've got amazing tongues. But we look at this idea of poison and we think, yes, we can be poisonous too. We've got to be really careful not to say things that hurt other people, that cause them to um, be damaged by what we say. So now, talking about poison, let's get onto this subject of poison. Who likes frogs? This looks like a nice frog, doesn't it? A really pretty frog, again, really, really colourful. Really colourful. Now, this frog is the poison dart frog. So part of a group of frogs, the poison dart frog. And this frog is a posomatic. All right, there's a word. I don't know if you've ever seen it before. I haven't seen it before. That fro frog is a posomatic. I wonder what that means. That, does that mean it's a poser for pictures? In other words, when the camera's on it, it goes into a pose saying, hey, look at me, I'm pretty good. No, not what it means. A posomatic is a word that means that this frog is made so colourful that it is a warning for other people. It's a warning for other predators, things that might think, oh, I think I'm going to eat that frog. They would have a second thought when they wanted to eat that one because the more colourful the frog is, the more poisonous it is. And that's what the word aposomatic means. It means being colourful so that you show that you are dangerous and to eat you is not a good idea. So if you're another animal coming along that normally eats frogs, when you saw a really colorful frog like this, that animal would be warned to say, do not eat it, that frog is poisonous. All right? So there's some things that human beings can eat that are poisonous as well and we've got to be careful about it. So again, what an amazing thing, here is color, that God has created and he's created here for a very good reason as a warning to people so that they wouldn't eat poisonous things. But this is a frog, this picture here, you can see this one, I really think this frog is awesome. This is called the hairy frog. Pretty good name, isn't it? It looks like a hairy frog and it lives in tropical West Africa and it's called the hairy frog and it's got it, it, it stands up and it's got these nice little little uh, fingers and toes, they're really soft little fingers and toes like ours, that it can grab onto things and, and jump and hop away. And you think, oh, it looks pretty scary, but it's pretty harmless. It's just a frog. I think I'll pick it up because it's not very, it won't hurt me because it's only got soft. It's not like a, a, a cat or a lion who's got claws that can, can s scratch you. It's got these soft little fingers, and if I pick it up, It'll be, it'll be a bit slimy and a bit hairy, but it won't hurt me. No, you've got to be careful of this frog. You know why? Because it's also called the wolverine frog. Now, wolverine, that means it looks like a wolf. Well, it's hairy, but it's not just that. You know what it can do? This is an amazing thing. What it can do is in its hands, in its nice little hands, if it thinks you're gonna hurt it, it breaks the bones in its hands and forces the bones out through the skin to make claws of its broken bones. So it, it, gets the, it breaks its bones somehow or other by itself and the broken bits go through the skin and it comes out like claws and it'll scratch you. So instead of having nice soft little fingers, it, they, he turns them into claws and he grabs you and scratches. Eventually those bits of bone would fall off and he'd grow new bone inside, but he can break the ends off to create claws. And you think, wow, isn't that a clever defense mechanism? Isn't that a clever way to protect itself? That's a good idea. We could think of all sorts of things like that and people do. And you've heard of Wolverine. There he is, Hugh Jackman. All right, who does that? sticks out his uh, claws out of his hands. Where did they get that from? These frogs had done, it, had done it many, many years before they even thought of this idea of having this superhuman X-man doing things. So God has got all sorts of amazing things 
And human beings think they create fantasy things, but God has got them already in his creation. Now, here is another hard question. If you get this one right, you're very clever. Here is a little fellow called the horny toed lizard. He lives in the Arizona desert. I've been to the Arizona desert and it's a pretty scary place, I tell you. There's these huge um, uh, spiders we saw and, and these really dangerous fruit, this fruit that if it grabbed onto you, you can't get it off until you rip your skin off. You need to be careful of different trees. It's a scary place, the Arizona desert. I didn't see one of these, but I'm glad I didn't because this is the horny toed lizard. And I think, I don't think I'd pick him up because he looks a bit scary. He's already got claws on his feet and he's got these sharp spikes like a dragon and he looks like he'd be a bit dangerous to pick up. But he's got another defence mechanism. There's something he can do to protect himself so you don't even want to go near him. What do you think this lizard can do to protect itself from you? So if you are thinking of going to come down and, and pick up this little lizard and think, oh, he looks cute, I'm going to be careful with him, I won't hurt him, I'm going to pick him up. He doesn't want to be picked up. Do you know what he will do? Will he spit at you? No. Will he bite you? No. Can he jump really quickly? No, none of those. Has he got a sharp point on his tail that he can whip around and sting you with? No, none of those. Guess what he does? Something absolutely amazing. I don't know if you ever know this, but here is the answer. What he does, he shoots blood out of his eyes. Blood. He gets blood and he can shoot it 1.2 metres away. You could be a metre away coming close to this little fellow and he says, I don't want you to be near me. And blood comes out of his eyes and hits you to say, beware, he doesn't want you near him. What an amazing thing. Who ever thought of that? I can just imagine one of the angels thinking, well, oh, let's make this little lizard that shoots blood out of its eyes. And the other angels are saying, really? You know? But there it is. Isn't that amazing? All this information about our God. Now, we're going to talk about strong things. Here's the man who thinks or is the strongest man in the world at the time. The other day, actually, it was only a few weeks ago, there was a thing about some strong man that lifted up, um, I think it was five, just over 500 kilos. But he was a man, and he's one of the strong men of the world, and he is able to lift up a horse on his shoulders. Now, don't try this at home, all right? Do not try and lift a horse up at home. But this man lifted a horse up, and the horse weighs more than twice his own weight. So the horse is two times heavier than he is, and he picks up something twice as heavy as he is. He is a very strong man. So we're thinking about strong things, how strong things are. So human beings, the strongest human being, can lift something two times its own weight. All right? What about ants? How much can ants lift? They don't look very strong, do they? Look at that little skinny bit on the ant. It doesn't look very strong. It's a little backbone. You think, gee, that would break easy. And ants, how much can they lift? Can they lift up two times more than what they weigh? No, they can live up 50 times more than they can weigh. Ants can lift up like 50, 25 horses they can, they can lift uh, in, in the equivalent. All right? So 50 times their own weight but there's things that are stronger here's a beetle called the rhinoceros beetle and he looks like a pretty tough guy doesn't he? he looks like he's in armor plated he's going to go to battle and he's called the rhinoceros beetle guess how much he can lift up so the ants could lift 50 times the rhinoceros beetle can lift a hundred times twice as much as the ant of its own body weight, a hundred times its own body weight. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying it lifts up 50 horses, it lifts up a hundred times its own body weight, right? Which is the same as if you tried to lift up 50 horses. So if you try to lift 50 horses, there's no way you could. This rhinoceros beetle can, is stronger than you by 50 times. But one of the strongest, is the dung beetle. Now you've got to 
you've got to feel for the poor little beetle. If its life is, you know, pushing dung around all day long, it wants to be good at something, it can lift a whole lot more. Guess how much a dung beetle can lift. So humans can lift two times, ants can lift 50 times, rhinoceros beetles can lift 100 times, the dung beetle, 1,140 times its own body weight. Isn't that amazing? This beetle lifts more than 1,000 times its own body weight. That is so strong. And it, it doesn't look like it's got big muscles. He doesn't look like he's gone to the gym every day to build big muscles up. He's just made to be able to lift a huge uh, size relative to his own body. So we're talking about strength. But what's the strongest? Well, God is the strongest, of course. God holds the whole universe in his hand. That's how strong God is. He can hold everything in his hand. So when we think about strong things, we think, wow, that's pretty amazing. And then we think about God and we're in awe. That's the point. We're just blown away by the strength of God. Now, we're talking about beetles. And here's another beetle I, I really think is really interesting. This beetle is called the Bombardier beetle. It bombards you with something. It does something to you. All right? And it is not a strong one. It doesn't need to be strong. It's a very clever beetle. Do you know what this beetle can do? Some of you might have heard of it. You don't go close to this beetle and you don't annoy it. If you see one of these beetles, you don't go up and try to touch it and annoy it because you know what it does? It does this. Here's someone trying to annoy the beetle and they've got this metal uh, stick. You see this bit of uh, silver pipe, a little stick. And they're annoying the beetle and the beetle squirting something at them right the beetle says i'm annoyed and he turns around and he squirts in the direction of if it's being annoyed so if you come close to that beetle and you try and touch it and annoy it you're going to get squirted with something now what's he going to squirt you with well he squirts you with a a gas an explosive gas that is super hot 212 degrees Fahrenheit. It is super hot. Uh, that Fahrenheit, uh, it, 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 that gas is really, really hot. So if you come close, what will happen? Well, there was a man that did this to show us. All right, I'm glad this isn't me. I didn't do it, but someone did. And he went there and he put his finger on this. He got squirted with the gas. And what happened? Have a look. Burnt his finger. Because right? that is really, really hot gas that comes out of that, out of that uh, beetle. But it's, how does he get the gas? Well, if you saw back there, he got the gas he's got inside. He's got two containers of hydrogen peroxide. And he's got this enzyme called hydroquinone. And what he does, he puts a little bit of hydrogen peroxide into this explosion chamber, a little bit of this hydroquinone in it, mixes it together, and oof, out comes this gas and he releases it and he mixes it up together. You know, people say, oh, we think things evolved. You know, this, this, this beetle evolved and, and designed this itself. You can imagine how many times if it, if it tried to experiment with the mixture and, and it didn't have the right thing and it, it would have exploded itself. It would have burned itself up. It would be like a, a terrorist bomb, you know, going off trying oh, that didn't work, let's try it again. And he keeps on blowing his insides out. It's ridiculous to think that this animal could just evolve to develop such a complex combination of things that is just so dangerous. If you got it wrong, you know, you'd blow yourself up. You wouldn't want to do that. But he's got that and it works every time perfectly. That's the Bombardier beetle. Now, we're going to talk about fast things. I don't know if any of you are fast runners. I reckon that that um, uh, Joseph Richards, I reckon he used to be pretty fast, didn't he? All right. uh, I know his mum used to do a lot of running, but here's a fast man. Does anyone know this man's name? All right. He's a very fast runner. He's so fast that when all the others are trying to run to catch him, he can look behind uh, and say, oh, what are they doing back there? If he was a chameleon, of course, he wouldn't have to look behind. He could still look forward and his eyes could go back, but he's not. And he could turn back and say, oh, look, I'm beating them, which is not a good idea in the race, but when you're that fast, you can. 
That man's name is Usain Bolt. All right, and he has a top speed of 43 kilometers an hour, and he can do the 100 meters in 9.58 seconds. And he's the fastest man. So a human being's running, uh, he is a very fast man, and he can run at 43 kilometers an hour. All right, so your cars can go faster than that, of course, but human beings running, he does 43 kilometers an hour. So that's pretty fast, isn't it? Let's talk about speed, though. Here's a boy. I don't know how many of you are seven years of age, but here's a boy who's seven years of age. He can do the 100 metres in 13.48 seconds. Um, and, and I never got to be able to do it that fast, uh, even when I was you know, a, a late teenager racing at high school. I could never do it that quick. He does the 100 metres in 13.48 seconds, and he's seven years age, of age. So... Human beings, some people can run very fast, much faster than others. And look how far out the front. And he's winning in the, in the American um, uh, championships. Uh, this boy is the fastest boy, they reckon, in the world. He's very fast. So we're talking about fast things. Before we talked about strong things, now we're talking about fast things. Well, I have had the same car for 45 years. There's my car, all right? And it's a V8. It's only a little V8, but it's a V8. Can it do 100, 0 to 100 in 2.4 seconds? That's pretty fast, isn't it? 0 to 100 in 2.4 seconds. So in other words, you stopped, you put your foot on the accelerator, and you end up doing 100 kilometers an hour 2.4 seconds later. And then, of course, the police pick you up because you're only supposed to be doing 50 in the zone. But... 100, not to 100 in 2.4 seconds. No, my car, car can't do that. I would have to spend $3.1 million to buy a car that can go not to 100 in 2.4 seconds. Here's the fastest car. Here's the car that can do that. A Bugatti Chiron. This car, you can buy it if you want. You can register on the road. I haven't seen any in Australia, but... I don't know if there is one in Australia, but the Bugatti Chiron goes not to 100 in 2.4 seconds. It's the fastest production car in the world, but it will cost you $3.1 million. So that's that particular car. That's very fast, isn't it? And human beings think, how clever are we to make a car that can go that fast? 100 kilometers in 2.4 seconds. Now, I like cars, so I thought, oh, Bugattis, they sound pretty good. So I bought a Bugatti. Do you want to see the Bugatti I bought? It's a really good one. I didn't buy this one. I bought the model just below this one. Here's my Bugatti. I bought the Bugatti Veyron. There it is. There's my Bugatti Veyron. And it goes from 0 to 1 kilometre in 2.4 seconds. So it's got two speeds on it, and it's got forward and reverse. It also plays Let It Go, uh, amongst other musical tunes on it. And there's my test driver, Zach, driving my Bugatti. So we think things go very fast and we like to think about speed. What about a fast animal? Here's a fast animal. You know, the fastest animal is a cheetah. It can do 100 metres in 5.95 seconds. That's that's much. That's three times faster than that man Usain Bolt. The cheetah's three times farther, faster. It can go 121 kilometers an hour, and it goes not to 100 in three seconds. So here is God, who's made an animal that can go fast as that car that human beings make that cost them 3.1 million, and God made an animal that can do that just as easily. God is awesome. So if the cheetah had a race with Usain Bolt, guess who would be grinning at the end? Who's the winner of that race? It's the cheetah. The cheetah can go three times faster than any man can ever run. And here's a little bird. Cute little thing. Again, how pretty is this bird? How colourful? Here's a hummingbird. And this hummingbird is very fast as well. Remember we looked at the bees and how much they can flap their wings? Well, this 
hummingbird flaps its wings 80 flaps a second. It takes 250 breaths a minute. All right, we do about 70. Its heart beats 1,200 times a minute. We do about 60. It can fly 48 kilometers an hour and dive at 96 kilometers an hour. It is a very fast, tiny little bird that can do amazing things. And it's just this tiny little, look how, look how small it is relative to somebody's hand. It is beautiful, just beautifully designed and does all those things in this little bird. And God has made that to show us how awesome he is, how amazing he is. But what's the fastest thing? What's the fastest thing? And people talk about Star Wars and space things and warp speed. And they say, this is really fast. We know the fastest thing that is ever, that exists as far as we know, the fastest thing, the fastest thing is light. And now this is, I, I really don't, comprehend this but how fast light is you know how fast light is light is nearly 300,000 kilometers a second so we we're talking about you know um, small amounts a second here is 300,000 kilometers a second so in one second like that like 1,000 remember the, the, you say 1,000 when you say 1,000 light has gone around the earth seven and a half times now sorry i just that boggles me i just can't comprehend that because that is just amazing and these are huge numbers huge figures how fast light is light goes around the earth you know seven and a half times in one second so it's like you turn a torch on and that light is traveling around the earth seven and a half times in one second. That is amazing. And because it's amazing, it means the size of things in the universe are so big, like we saw before in the stars. How far is the earth from the moon? 1.3 light seconds. Remember how fast light travels? Well, light it takes 1.3 seconds to get from the moon to the earth. So when you see the moon, that light's taken 1.3 seconds to get there. From the sun, it takes eight light minutes. From Mars, who can guess that one? Have a go. From Mars, 12.7 light minutes. All right, so Mars is a little bit further from us than the sun, going the other way, of course. What about Alpha Centauri, which is our closest star? How far, how many minutes would it take? Not minutes, years. Light takes 4.4 light years to get from Alpha Centauri. Remember, we looked before that Andromeda galaxy, and that took 2.5 million light years. So our closest star is 4.4 light years. What about the other side of our galaxy? 52,000 light years just to be on the other side of our Milky Way galaxy. So that, that when we talk about fast things, we started off with a fast runner and a fast car and a fast animal, but God's saying, fast, you don't understand fast. I'll show you fast. Fast is light. And God is super fast and, and, and super powerful. All right, what are we going to talk about now? we're going to talk about stars. And you'll say, oh, Uncle David, we talked about stars last time. Well, I'm going to talk about different star this time. And you've got to say, I'm going to put a star on the screen and you've got to say, who's the first person to say what star it is? Are you ready? You've got to yell it out when you see it. What star is this one? Starfish. It's exactly. It's actually called a sea star or a starfish is correct as well a sea star or a starfish. And I'm going to talk about this sea star. This sea star, you think, oh, it's just an ordinary little thing. It is amazing. They have eyes at the end of each of their arms. So sea stars can be, have different arms. They can have five arms. They can have 40 arms. It doesn't matter how many arms they have. They have an eye at the end of each one of them. Now, it's fairly rudimentary eye. It just sees light and dark, but that's enough. For the starfish to know if it wants to go to light or it wants to go to dark and it has these little eyes at the end of its legs 
and it doesn't have blood in it. It has water and it pumps water through itself and has these little things out the end with water. And when it pumps, the waters pump and it makes these little feet go with the water and it moves by pumping water through itself. With these, and these little feet go out and they, they uh, walk, the tube feet walk along and it can go fairly quickly actually using these little water pump tube feet. And sea stars are quite amazing. But that's not the amazing thing about sea stars. This is what I think is amazing about sea stars. What do they eat? Sea stars like to eat mussels and clams. And there you can see a sea star wrapping around this clam, this shell. And inside the shell, of course, of the clam is an animal uh, that the sea star wants to eat. It doesn't want to eat the shell. It doesn't like shells. It can't eat shells. It wants to eat the animal inside. How's it going to eat that animal inside? Well, it goes around the shell. It covers it like with its arms and with these little, little um, feet. And then it squeezes and squeezes and squeezes and it pops the shell open. And then inside is this animal. But the sea star's only got a tiny, tiny little mouth, really, really tiny mouth. How's it going to eat that animal inside the seashell? Well, it does an amazing thing. What it does is it gets its stomach, pulls its stomach out of its mouth and pushes its stomach inside the shell and wraps its stomach around the animal in there and then dissolves it all so it eats it. And once it's all dissolved, it pulls its stomach back inside its mouth again, back into its body and then digests it. Sounds pretty gross, doesn't it? We thought it was pretty bad having that chameleon at our, our fraternal sticking his tongue out and grabbing sausage rolls. Can you imagine if you had a fraternal and everyone stood there and they suddenly went in this and grabbed it and their stomachs came out and they grabbed the sausage roll and they pulled it back in through their mouth into their, into their body, what that would be like? be pretty gross but that's how sea stars do it and they have to do it because that's how they can how they because they love to eat the animals inside clams it'd be like you know imagine if sea star went to maccas what would it have to do well if it went to maccas it'd have to get the box and it'd get there and open the box up and once it had the burger in there and out would come its stomach out of its mouth grab the burger dissolve the burger and put it all back into its stomach again so it can eat the maccas I don't think, though, I've seen any sea stars at the drive through at Macca's. And you know why? Sea stars can't drive. Simple answer. But what sea stars can do is they can regenerate lost limbs. Here's a picture of a sea star, and it's got one really long leg and uh, four smaller legs. And the reason is, in actual fact, the long leg was, as, was the size of the star used to be it got damaged and all the other legs uh, got cut off and it started growing itself again it can grow if it's got part of its central disc and one of its legs it can grow it takes years but it can grow the rest of its body back again wouldn't that be amazing i mean joseph richards would like to be able to do that he could grow another toe wouldn't that be good all right, just imagine eventually if something gets cut off, you could grow something. Sea stars can do that. So here's this sea star. Amazing things. They can regenerate lost limbs. They can swallow large prey using their stomachs. They have eyes, but they can't see. They have legs, but they don't know where they're going because they can't plan things. They have no brain. They're not like you and I. We have brains, we can do things. And the Bible says, you won't be able to understand some of the things that God's prepared for you. God has got amazing things prepared. And, and, and he explains the difference between what we are now and what we can become and will become in the future. He says, God says, look, what you're like now is like a worm or like a grub, all right? And you think, oh, that's not very nice, is it? It's God saying, yeah, don't worry. You might be like that now, but you know what you can become? You can become this amazing butterfly. And you know this idea that that grub can turn into that butterfly. 
this metamorphosis. And God is saying, this is what I can do for you. I am amazing and I've got amazing plans for you because God wants us to fly. God wants us to soar like a butterfly. He doesn't want us to stay like a grub. He wants us to be transformed, to be very different. And that quote about what God is preparing is based upon this little picture that Jesus spoke about, the parable of the prodigal son. And when the father comes back to meet him, he said, that's what the, our God is like. He wants to rush up and grab us and do amazing things for us. This is our God. So the universe is big like we saw last time we were together with you. And the reason is because God is there. The purpose of the universe is to say, show the glory of God. It's shouting out. It's telling us how amazing God is because God is really, really big. But not only is God big, he also looks at detail. And here's a quote that says, God says, I am promised things. Right? I'm going to give you big promises, astronomical promises. I will multiply your seed, he says to Abraham, like the stars of heaven or like the sand on the seashore. So you're talking about sand. So God does these amazing things. He says, I will do great promises. I will give you amazing guarantees. I will show you amazing love, greater love than you can uh, understand. And I will show you amazing detail. How much detail can God see? Well, here's a picture of a finger. And on the finger, can you see there? On the finger is a grain of sand. So we're talking about God saying, like the sand on the seashore, grain of sand. We look before at stars. Now let's talk about sand very quickly before we finish. What about sand? How amazing is sand? There's a single grain of sand. Do you know what also is the size of a grain of sand? Well, here's something. Here is a microchip, the size of a piece of sand that has the entire text of the Hebrew Bible on it. It's 300,000 words. So human beings think they're very clever and they've got 300,000 words of a text on this tiny grain of sand. Now, that's clever, isn't it? That's pretty clever. That was done in, in a uni at Haifa. And actually, in fact, it was given as a gift. Do you know who was given a gift to? The Jewish people gave this a gift, the Hebrew Bible, right, on this little uh, microchip the size of a grain. They gave it to the Pope of all people. It was a gift to the Pope from the Jewish people. But anyway, 300,000 words on a grain of sand. Now, you think that's pretty clever, isn't it? And it is clever. But how many grains of sand on Earth? 7.5 billion billion. Now, that's a tenth of how many stars there are, but it's still a lot of sand. So there's more stars, there's 10 times more stars in the universe than there is sand on the Earth. That's pretty amazing. But this little creature, he's also the size of a grain of sand. So God's made these creatures called Tardigrades, they call them water bears, and he's smaller than a grain of sand as well. And they are amazing little creatures. So one grain of sand contains 500 billion billion atoms. So now we're talking about small things. What about atoms? Atoms in the grain of sand. I'm sorry, I, I know I'm probably saying numbers that don't mean anything because they're just so big because there's... There's more atoms in a grain of stars, a grain of sand than stars in a billion galaxies. So we're talking about amazing numbers. And look at this number. In water molecules, in one drop of water, all right, there are 1.7 billion trillion molecules. So in a few drops of water, there are more molecules than all the stars in the universe. Now remember last time we talked to stars in the universe? Now we're seeing a few drops of water have more molecules than that. So what is it saying to us? See, God is a God of detail. 
God is amazing and he is, he is like infinite in what he can do and he's unmeasured. You can't measure God. That's, that's what we'd be saying. It boggles. We can't measure. It's too big for us and God is too big and he knows the details and God knows the names of all the stars. None of them are missing. God knows everyone, all the grains of sand. It's like God could name every grain of sand uh, on the earth. And have names them like Ted and, and Ted and, and Bob and Dorothy and Mary and and Claude. He, God's got names for, for names them all and knows if one's missing. Oh, where's Claude gone? Oh, he's, he's 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 washed off down the beach somewhere. God knows all of that. This is the sort of thing we're talking about. God has amazing care, amazing detail, and we get a little insight of this when we look at what the Bible says. Even the hairs on your head. Are numbered, all right. You've got a hundred thousand hair follicles, and they're all numbered. God knows how many hairs on your head. He knows every time a sparrow dies. The Bible's trying to explain to us that God has amazing care for us. So how terrible, says the Bible. How terrible is it for people to argue and said, "Ah, oh, I don't think God made me. I don't think there's a God." People say, "No." Nah, I don't think, I don't believe in God. There's no, nothing out there. I think things are just beautiful because they're beautiful. That's rubbish. And here's what the Bible says. Does a clay pot say to the potter, what are you doing? Does the thing that made say to its maker, oh, you haven't got any hands. You haven't made this. You haven't made sea stars and hummingbirds and chameleons. You haven't done that. Something else has done it all. They've just done it themselves. This beetle design, these exploding explosive gas chambers just all by itself that's that's crazy isn't it all right and so the bible goes on saying those people are confused they think that the clay is equal to the potter you see this is like human beings saying oh we're a clay pot aren't we clever we're cleverer than the man that, that made us the god that made us the, the potter do you think an object can tell the one that made it Oh, no, you didn't make me. Something else made me. It's like the pot saying to the maker, you don't know anything. This is what the Bible says. The book of Isaiah says that. But God says, I made the earth. I created man. My hands have made this. I'm the one who did this. I made it and stretched the heavens and I made all the stars on the heaven. We have an awesome God. And he has done amazing things and beautiful things and incredible things just to show us how amazing he is, how, how wonderful he is, what a, what a future he has got in store for us. And he knows our names. Not only does he know our names, he knows how many hairs are on our head. And that's pretty awesome. And the reason, our final um, information that we want to tell you, the reason is because God so cares for us. He cares so much. He's trying to explain all of this to saying, look, I care for you. I might be awesome, but I really care about you and I want you to be in my kingdom for eternity. That's the God that we worship. Thank you, Joseph.